All right, guys. So welcome back. Uh, so where we left off last was we were talking about a memory bounded uh, heuristic search and um, talked about an iterative deepening A star search, right? Which is using the um, F cost. By F cost, I mean that evaluation function cost to control, you know, the depth um, instead of using, you know, arbitrary integers uh, from before. Uh, from the previous deepening algorithm. Um, now, we were going to talk about the recursive best first search, which was an alternative approach that uses recursion. Uh, but as I was going back and reviewing stuff, looking through uh, the other videos, just checking out the chapter, I noticed that the running time of the videos that I have up so far for the lecture videos, right, for the lectures, it's already exceeded, um, or pretty close to exceeding, two weeks worth of lecture, right? So uh, I gotta wrap this up. So I'm gonna go ahead, I think, and skip. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail and, and trace through uh, this algorithm like I originally had planned to, in the interest of time, because I'm kinda out of time with chapter three, and I gotta move on to other things. Um, but I will just say this, um, you know, you can skim through this and you know, check it on your own, see if you can read through it. Um, the, the big thing here is that it's using the call stack to manage space. And um, the thing to realize is that how this works is that through the recursive tree, that F limit is getting passed. You know, by F limit, I mean the evaluation function cost. And so uh, once this algorithm, you know, hits a point where it has to make a decision, right? It's gonna compare the F cost of a current node as opposed to the next best option, okay? And so if the next best option is lower, well then it backtracks using the call stack, okay? So you can see that um, by the tracing um, or, or through the, this figure here as the uh, tree grows. So this works in a similar way to the regular A star search. It's just it uses recursion and um, like I said, the back or the stack, the call stack to try to use fewer resources. And um, I'll just leave it at that because I need to finish off by talking a little bit about heuristic functions. And um, you know, if three, section 3.6, I'll just try to burn through this as fast as I can to wrap this up because uh, this has gone on too long. but. I had mentioned in a previous video that I wasn't going to get into too much detail about heuristic functions because you can have whole classes on the best ways of writing heuristic functions, and, and that's true. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. But section 3.6, the, the authors try to give you a feel for how you could write a heuristic function or, or, or what goes into it. Okay, so just to give you something else to think about, we looked at some alternative examples. So we looked at that straight line distance heuristic function. Okay, fine, you know, that was, that was um, a heuristic function for that particular problem, okay, and uh, it worked for the example. But here's some other things just to think about, okay, and uh, this section in the text, they also summarize uh, performance of, you know, one search versus another using a heuristic function that is written a different way. Okay, so you can think about um, a heuristic function for an eight puzzle and a 15 puzzle, right? So remember the eight puzzle, it's got those nine squares and the eight slides that move around. Well, you can have a 15 puzzle that has uh, 16 squares with 15 tiles that move around. Okay, so the average solution cost for the eight puzzle, 22 steps, right? You gotta, on average, you gotta move um, the, the uh, tiles around 22 times, right? And that leads to a branching factor in the search tree of three. Okay, now if, um, if we take a look at a situation where the blank is in the middle, you know, you've got four possibilities. Okay, north, south, east, west. Okay, and when you know the blank is in a corner, there's two possibilities there. 
And when it's along an edge, there's three possibilities on how it can move, right? So that's kind of where the math comes from that, from that uh, branching factor, right? Now, with all these possibilities, uh, if you were to do an exhaustive tree search, going all the way to depth 22, right? To where all the levels, 22 levels, okay? What you end up with is uh, a number of states and therefore a number of nodes that's three to the 22nd power or 3.1 um, times 10 to the 10 states, okay? Now, you know, the graph search can cut that down by a lot, right? So if you um, remember the difference between tree, graph, the um, graph remembers states you've generated and so you'll just ignore them uh, if you come across them again. So by doing that, again, we won't get too heavy into the math. You know, I'm not going to prove this to you. I'm just, I'm just taking the textbook's word for it, and uh, you can take my word for it. It's good enough. The point here is that how you frame the problem can have a dramatic impact on the performance. So you can cut it down by a factor of 170,000, where you've got uh, 9 factorial divided by 2 uh, states, right? which 181,440 states that are reachable. Okay. Um, so that's manageable, okay? But if you, but if you, um, you know, do the math on a 15 puzzle, suddenly it becomes 10 to the 13th power number of states. So it gets much, 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 huge, much, much, much bigger, okay? So to cut this down or to uh, try to, you know, improve efficiency, what we want to have is we want to have a heuristic function that is better, right? At giving better guesses to help you move tiles um, in a more intelligent way or, or, or to help guide the movement of the tiles. So that way it takes fewer overall movements of the tiles to end up with the solution, right? So remember, you know, here's our start state and we want this goal state, right? Now, depending on the heuristic function, the heuristic function is gonna tell you you know, we'll move the two or the five or the six or the three. And depending on how you move that function um, or how you define that function, it can result in fewer possible moves you have to take, fewer possible actions, and therefore fewer nodes that get generated, and therefore less memory you have to take, less time it takes, all that. Okay, now it's important that these heuristic functions, no matter how they're written, that they don't overestimate the number of steps, right? Because that could lead to, because you want a heuristic function that's gonna, that's going to, you know, help you to get a uh, optimal solution, meaning the fewest number or the lowest cost possible. In this case, you know, the cost just translates to how many times you move a, a, a tile, right? So in this case, it would be, we want a heuristic function that's gonna result in us having to move the fewest tiles overall possible. That'd be our optimal solution. Fewer tiles we have to move, fewer states have to get generated because that means fewer child states, okay? So we have to make sure that you never overestimate the number of steps to that goal because if you overestimate, that's gonna have you going down different branches, generating additional states, right? So for this type of puzzle, there's two commonly used candidates for creating heuristic functions, okay? Um, and the text refers to it as H1 and H2, okay? So uh, one approach is, you know, the number of misplaced tiles. And again, this is just a high level, you know, overview of thinking about, well, how could I, how could I construct this heuristic, right? And then you would, you'd come up with a heuristic function and then you test it and, you know, maybe run, you know, uh, you know run a simulation 10,000 times and see what gives you the best uh, result, H1 or H2. So the number of misplaced tiles so here, what we have is we've got eight misplaced tiles, right? Because, you know, if we want them in this order, well, in the start state, there, there's eight tiles that are out of order, okay? Um, because, you know, seven's obviously out of order because it's supposed to be blank um, when you're finished. Two's out of order because it should be one in that position. Four's not in the right position because it's supposed to be two and so forth, right? So these are eight tiles that are in the wrong position, okay? Um, another way to do it is uh, what the textbook refers to as H2, uh, and that's the sum of distances, okay? 
um, of the different tiles, it should say tiles there, from their gold positions. So if you assume that you can't move a tile diagonally, then that would mean, you know, if you take a look at this uh, tile one, well, it's one, two, three positions away or three moves out of position. Um, two is one, right? Because if you'd have to move it one square to the right. Um, three is, um, is one, two, it's two steps out of position. You know, four is two also, right? So you just keep going and you just add all that up. And so that's another way of um, evaluating a state, okay? Using the heuristic function. You know, how many tiles are out of position? Or um, that's H1. Or um, for each tile, how many spaces away is it from where it's supposed to be in the goal state, okay? So that second one, H2, that's known as the city block distance or Manha Manhattan distance um, heuristic because, you know, if you're in, you know, if you're in a city or something, you know, someone's, when you ask somebody directions, they'll say, oh, well, go down two blocks, turn right, and go another three blocks. It's, it's that kind of idea. So if we were to do the math according to that measurement for figure 3.28, right, the total of all of those squares or all of those tiles their distance away from their correct positions comes out to 18. okay okay so we can measure the overall performance um, using a derivation i guess you could say um, a, a form of the branching factor and the textbook calls it the effective branching factor b star so here's a definition. I don't know of any way that I could cut this down um, to make it any clearer. So I'm just gonna, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm just gonna read this to you. If total number of nodes generated by a star search for a problem is N and solution depth is D, then B star is the branching factor that a uniform tree of depth D would have to have in order to contain N plus one nodes. Okay, so what this is basically saying is, um, if you got, you have all these nodes, right, that are generated by the A star search, okay, and uh, that total number is n. The solution depth that means, um, you know, from your start node down to the goal node, okay. If that depth is d, then b star is going to be that branching factor. It's a uniform tree, right? I mean, it's got a nice even shape of depth d. That would have to have in order um, that branching factor that a uniform tree of depth D would have to have in order to contain um, N plus one nodes. So B star is the branching factor that that uniform tree of depth D would have to have in order to contain N plus one nodes. So that's kind of giving you an idea of, um, you know, what that, that measurement is. Um, it's telling you what your branching factor would have to be for a uniform tree where the depth goes down so low, okay? So if that's the case, then you can say, well, then n plus one is equal to, and here's some mathy stuff. I don't wanna to get too much into mathy stuff, but um, you know, you got your start node and then you gotta go all the way down, right? So um, one plus b star, you know, and every single time you move down, you're moving down another level. So this is one level, two levels, all the way down to the depth. So, for example, if A star finds a solution at depth 5 using 52 nodes, B star is going to be 1.92. So that's your effective branching factor. Okay, On average, for each node, you're going to end up having to generate 1.92 nodes. Right. So it's not perfect. It's an estimate, but it's a, it's a guide. And the reason that we're kind of talking about this is that it's going to set up a comparison here that we're going to see in just a second. Now I want to test, am I going to ask you, hey, um, effective branching factor, B star, give me a definition. No way. I don't have that memorized. This is just a guide that the textbook sets up for us to be able to have this discussion and compare quantitatively or, or qualitatively uh, the difference performances, the difference the performance makes um, just based off of how you define your heuristic function. Okay, so the best heuristic the very, very, very best would be a branching factor of one, okay? An effective branching factor of one. All right, so now authors of the textbook, they, um, 
ran the simulation like I suggested, you know, that, like I mentioned you know, a few minutes ago. Um, you know, you can run a simulation, find your best values, whatever. So for here, what they did is they ran 1,200 simulations essentially. Okay, and the solution lengths ran anywhere from two to 24 nodes. Okay, and um, they went through and they said, all right, let's do a version of, let's compare iterative deepening search. Okay, and uh, A star using that H1 heuristic and then H star using that H2 heuristic. Now remember the iterative de deepening search was like a version of depth first search where you know, it was limited by depth and it just kept going and going and going where the depth limit increased by one each time. So here's a table that is um, comparing performance according to this effective branching factor, okay? All right, so um, search cost, here's the cost, okay? These are the total nodes that are generated. So remember we talked before about how we can compare the performance of different algorithms in terms of memory and time. And if you just say, all right, well, we'll just think about each node is going to have to take up a fixed amount of memory. Okay, fine. So the more, the more nodes generate, the more memory you take. Um, and then you can also assume that each node is going to take a certain amount of time to uh, create. So you're going to take a certain amount of time to create in a certain amount of space of memory. Okay. So, you know, relative to each other, one node versus another node, I mean, they're both the same size, it's gonna take roughly the same time to create either of them in memory, fine, right? So, um, here's a list of all the nodes that were generated based off of these random problems, these simulations. So, the iterative deepening search, you know, found a solution or went all the way down to level 12. That was, that was their cutoff. Okay, they said, let's go, to, let's go to level 12. And so this was the total number of nodes that had to be generated um, according to these parameters um, for the iterative deepening search at its deepest depth. Okay, now look at the A star search using that H1 heuristic guiding the search. Um, and that H1 heuristic was just counting how many tiles were out of place. Well, at level 12, it generated only 227 nodes. Okay, keep going, um, and you'll find, you know, your solution on average. You know, down to I think when they just they just ran it down to uh, depth 24. But um, just to continue to show you how the growth is impacted. So if it had to keep going to a tree depth of 24, I mean that's still a fraction. I mean look at the um, iterative deepening search at a depth of 12, had to generate 3,644,035 no, uh, nodes. A star with that H1 heuristic, 39,135. Now, A star with the H2 heuristic, just 1,641 nodes. So what's the idea? What's the point? You're like, oh, great, that's neat. Why are you telling me all this? <laughs> you know, the, the big idea is the algorithms you choose matter, okay? And if you are using a guided search, the heuristic functions you choose and how you write them matter a ton because the A star search is better than iterative deepening just on its face, right? But even then, choosing the, the heuristic function can have a profound impact on performance, okay? And so here's that effective branching factor where it was trying to calculate essentially what the average number of child nodes is that you'd have to generate at each level. So you can see that um, you know at the lowest depth, you know the effective branching factor for the IDS was 2.78. But look at for A star search, you know for that first heuristic 1.48, and then for that second heuristic even better. All right, so A star H2 is well 50,000 times more efficient than uh, iterative deepening search at a depth of 12. I mean that's crazy. Right, so the amount of thinking, the amount of intelligence that you can program into a machine is always going to be limited by the amount of resources you have on hand, right? So you may not be able to have infinite resources, but the algorithms you choose to do the thinking, the search algorithms in this case, in this chapter, can have a profound impact on the, on the overall performance and how much thinking you can actually do, 
right? So by using A star search with that H2 heuristic, you can examine a heck of a lot, or you can find a, a solution a heck of a lot faster, and you can use a heck of a lot less memory, right? Like an iterative deepening search. You know, if you find your solution at depth 12, that's 3 million, 600,000 some odd nodes you had to generate. That's a heck of a lot slower than A star search with the H1 heuristic or H star, uh, A star with H2. Which one do you think you'd rather have power um, your AI for a game? Which one do you think is going to run faster? I mean, look at that. The, the, the difference in um, performance is profound. Okay. Uh, you can um, even play around with this. You can tweak with this a little bit. And so, you know, you can um, mess around with the heuristics and relax some of the some of the uh, requirements, right? So for H1 and H2, we were saying, well, you know, the uh, tiles can only move a certain way. They can't go diagonal and uh, they can only go north-south and you can't move it. Two tiles can't, can't uh, occupy the same space, right? But if you relax that, right? If you make just one change, you say, well, a tile can go anywhere, even if it's already occupied or, or it doesn't have to go, um, let me let me rephrase. It doesn't have to go, um, you know, just one tile down or one tile over, right? Maybe you, in your heuristic, you say, okay, well, what happens if we could make a tile, you know, jump across a square, you know? Or what if you could have tiles, like I was saying, what if you could have tiles that that uh, can move into occupied squares? What if you could have two tiles per square, right? Um, then you could still have the uh, solution found, but you could potentially find it much faster, right? Because the H1 heuristic would give the exact number of steps in the shortest solution. H2 gives the exact number of steps in the, in the uh, shortest solution, right? So, you know, by playing around with that, you get the shortest solution, you get the same answer, right? Um, but you're getting closer. You're, you're changing the way that the heuristic function is guiding the um, is guiding the uh, search, right? So your search tree structure might be a little bit different, and there's more than one solution to the to the eight puzzle and the sixteen puzzle. But by modifying H1 and H2 in you know these ways, you know you can get your solution shorter. Okay, so fewer actions to get from the start state to the goal state. Okay, so what's a relaxed problem? One with fewer action restrictions. So we had fewer action restrictions on this. Basically what that does is this right here. It adds additional edges in the state space. Okay, because remember that in the state space, you've got each, each node in the graph represents a particular state. Okay, and each edge represents an action. So if I go with a strict problem, you know, a tile, if it's in the very center, you know, it can either move up, left, down, or right, okay? Assuming that there's an empty square for it to move into, right? So if I got a tile right in the middle and the empty space is right on the right-hand side, then the only space it can turn, or the only state it can transition into is by taking the action that moves right. That's one edge, okay? But if Instead, you relax the problem and you say, well, no, it can, it can occupy um, that tile. We can, we can move it into another square that's already occupied. Well, guess what? Now, that adds three additional states that you could generate, right? Three subsequent states. And so that adds three edges, okay? All right. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's the power. That's why it works, okay? Uh, that's why it speeds things up. All right. Is there anything else here I want to say about this? Yeah, I mean, you're basically just removing one or more conditions, right? So you'd remove conditions for your heuristic function when it's doing its calculations. And then, um, you know, test it. See if it gives you better results. If it does, awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see here. And if you're not sure which heuristic function... You know derivation of your original version which relaxed one is the best well then run all of the heuristic functions right so 
the actual heuristic function that you used to help guide the search could just return um, the best score from all of the derived versions. Does that, does that make sense, right? So you have your original version. You're like, well, can we can we tweak this to make it better? Let's change some of these rules a little bit. Based, you know, that that the heuristic function uses to evaluate the current state, right? And then uh, we'll try that one and we'll see if we get better results. Um, or if we can't get better results with just one of them, you know, uh, with one derived version or with one, you know, relaxed version, let's try a couple different approaches. And then every single time, you know, the, as the search is running, it needs to evaluate. Well, then just, you know, have every single one of these heuristic functions, these, these derived versions, these relaxed versions, you know, tell us what they think. And then uh, go with the best score from the group. Okay. Another way you could do it is you can just say, well, let's not consider every single tile, right? Let's do um, a subset of those tiles and then base our scores off of that, okay? Um, you can have, what you, what you can do is, is you can say, all right, um, let's build, another thing you can do is you can say, let's build a, a database of patterns, right? So for example, um, if you're into a state where as your search is flowing, if you're examining a state that has these tiles here, one, two, three, and four uh, in them, right? The heuristic function doesn't need to necessarily consider every single tile when it's evaluating its position, right? You could have a table that says, oh, well, um, you know, if you have your tiles in these particular positions, then there's a combination of four uh, tiles that 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 could possibly occupy those positions and so you can just do a lookup on the table instead and only have to do an evaluation of you know a combination of states that revolves around these four tiles instead of all eight right so that cuts down on your effective branching factor because you know you would have one two three four and then you could look up at the table and say okay what are the possible combinations of states you know, based off the fact that we have these tiles arranged in a particular order. Okay, what are all the states that you have? Oh, you got three states. Okay, cool, then just, just give them to me. Right, give them to me and um, and we'll evaluate those and uh, throw them into the, into the search. Okay. All right, so pattern databases store the exact solution cost for every possible sub-problem instance, right? So, you know, when you have um, your tiles in the, the t these two, four, three, and one, right? Subproblems are combinations of these other tiles in different positions, okay? What else do I want to say? Yeah, I mean, this, is, this, can, this can speed things up quite a bit, right? Because um, you can pre-store, right? You can say, well, any possible combination that that's... Um, of, uh, of other states that have two, four, three, and one in these positions, you can, you can pre-record the different point values. And so you can just say, oh, well, you know, based off of where the search could lead, um, this state with the numbers two, four, three, and one in it, um, on average leads to states that are worth 2.7, right? And so rather than having to evaluate all this stuff in the heuristic, you know, how many spaces over is this? How many spaces over is this? How many spaces you can just do that look up on the table and just grab those points okay so there's a there's a few different ways of looking at it but um you know there's a few different tweaks you can do i mean we can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on so what's the big idea thanks hank shut up what are you talking about you're rambling now you know how you craft that heuristic function can have an overall um huge impact on the performance of the search Okay, so you know, storing some patterns to you know in a table with some pre-recorded costs, right? One thing, just the algorithms you choose in general. Another thing, how you write your heuristic functions, whether you use that table of pre-recorded costs or not, um, whether you use a relaxed problem or you're relaxing some of the rules from the original heuristic or not, you know, um, all of these factors play into it and it's a constant fight, it's a constant struggle 
to come up with new ways to find the best solutions utilizing the least amount of resources, whether it be time or memory, okay? All right, so I think that's everything that I wanted to say on that. So, you know, reread over the slides. Um, I tried to skim over it as fast as I could to, to, to wrap this up, but skim over it and see if what I just said makes sense. Put it in context, right? That goes in a little bit more into the math here than I want to get into, um, but if you need more than that, it's here, okay? All right, so let's summarize. You know, agents can decide what to do in many, 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 many different ways, okay? There's a lot of different approaches for agents to use to figure out what they should do when you have environments that are deterministic, observable, static, and completely known, okay? So what you're doing is, is you're performing searches, right? You're going through and um, executing search algorithms. And the search algorithms allow the agent to come up with a plan, a sequence of actions, a series of actions, a list of actions. The agent finds itself in a current state. It says, what do I do now? I want to get over there. So what do I do? So what it does is it performs a search of the underlying state space according to all of those parts we've been talking about, right? And so that search is trying to generate nodes that represent the state space or states in the state space to take you from your current state to your goal state, okay? And then each action um, corresponds to an edge in that graph that represents the state space. So problems have what? Initial state, actions, the transition model, goal test and path cost function, and um, that environment, again, it's represented by the state space. So the initial state, where the agent finds itself, it does its thinking. Once it's finished its thinking by doing this search, it then does the execution of the solution, right? So think, execute, think, execute, think, execute. So initial state, where are you starting from? What are all the possible actions you can take from a state, okay? Um, then you have to have a transition model. So that was the results function we talked about. Remember that a state plus an action equals a successor state, okay? And so the search is doing all of this virtually, okay? It's doing all of it virtually, in memory. It's thinking, okay, what's, what are all the possibilities? What are all the states that I could possibly transition through in the real world? Let me think it through. If I'm in this state and I do this, well, then that would lead me over here. Hmm. But if I do this, well, that would lead me over here. Hmm. Okay, but what if I did this? Well, that would lead me over here and then over here, then over here. Hmm. But what if I do this? Well, that'll lead me over here. Hmm. Is that my goal? Is, yeah. Okay, cool. So here's my solution. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that. That's it. Um, so goal tests and a path cost, right? And so then after I decide I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, then in the real world, in the environment, I do that. So, you know, you got your goal test, your path cost function. You know, those are just the functions that say, hey, is that the state that I want to be in? Is that the goal? How much does it cost to get me there? Um, so that path through the state space from start to, from the start state to the goal state, that's your solution. And the solution represents a series of actions. Okay, so the search algorithms that we studied, all of them, some of them were in more depth than others, the states and actions are atomic. Okay, they are atomic. Tree search, they try to find all possible paths to a solution. And because of that, they can have repetition. They can have these loopy paths where state A leads to state B, leads to state C, which leads to state A, which leads to state B, which leads to state C, which leads to... Remember, you can avoid that if you carefully formulate the problem in terms of you know, what the actions are. But if it's impossible to formulate the problem, um, you know, and you can't avoid having loopy paths, then one of those graph search approaches would work better, right? And so what's the main difference? Graph search keeps track or keeps memory in its explored set of all the states that it's generated previously. And so if you ever generate a duplicate, you just ignore the duplicate and you keep on going. 
So we can uh, judge algorithms on their completeness. So what's that? If there's a solution to be found, will we find it? Optimality, will we find the best solution in terms of some cost metric? How long do the algorithms take? And how much memory do they take? Okay. The fewer nodes that are generated in the search, the better. Okay, um, let's see here. Uninformed search algorithms, they only know the problem definition. And so remember, start state, actions function, goal test function, result function, path cost function. We looked at breadth first search. The shallowest nodes are always getting expanded first. It's complete. You will find um, a solution if there is one to be found. Um, it's optimal, okay? And it has an exponential space complexity, okay? Because each node could generate you know, multiple nodes, okay? Based off of the branching factor. Uniform cost search, you know, you're just using a priority queue there. Um, and that's expanding nodes with the lowest path cost. So it's choosing those nodes to create children nodes for based off of, you know, if it has the, you know, whoever has the lowest cost. Okay, so that's optimal for general step costs. Um, you know, and when we talk about step costs, we're going from one node to another, taking an action. Okay, depth first search goes to the deepest unexpanded nodes first, not complete, you know, because it can um, end up in a, in a loop, okay, a loopy path. And uh, it's not optimal because you know, if you find a solution down this subtree, right, that's uh, at the very bottom of the tree, but you had another solution on the other side of the tree that was shallower, that was cheaper, you'll never, you'll never find this one. Okay, you can limit this thing by, um, you know, modifying it to make it a depth limited search. Iterative deepening, um, it's depth first search that's limited, but uh, you can just call it over and over and over again repeat it, you got that repetition, right? We're calling the depth first search, uh, the, the depth limited version. You're just increasing the depth each time until you find uh, what you're looking for, okay? Um, Bi-directional search, you're trying to speed things up a lot by searching in two directions with the overall idea that the number of nodes generated by each search is gonna be smaller than if you just ran one search. Okay, remember we had those two circles that we showed uh, of the graph? All right, so informed searches use heuristic functions to estimate a cost. And um, that generic best first search picks a node for expansion based on the evaluation function. I mean, they all do. It's just that the simplest version of this, um, you know, the evaluation function is just going to be um, purely greedy. It's only ever going to be going with the um, minimal HN cost. So HN basically becomes the evaluation function in that case. Not optimal, but it can be efficient. Okay, it can be efficient because you end up generating fewer nodes overall. But you find a solution, but that solution may not be the best because um, you know if you have a choice between three paths, right? This one might be the most expensive. This one maybe more uh, less expensive this one might be the least expensive so you choose to generate a node going down this path but one of these nodes over here leads to a goal with an overall smaller cost and you would have missed it an overall smaller path cost a star search picks nodes with a minimal evaluation function where you're using g of n which is just the path cost itself plus the heuristic okay um what else do I want to say here? Uh, it's complete and optimal if, if uh, the heuristic is admissible, which means if it will always, admissible just means if um, you're never gonna overestimate the cost. That's what admissible means, right? I kinda, I, now that I think about it, I kinda skipped over as I was going through that last section. It just means that if your, if your heuristic function is not overestimating the cost, then it's admi admissible. So. This search is going to be complete and it's going to be optimal if you know that you have a good heuristic function. That's all it means. Okay. Um, space complexity uh, is limiting. Um, so, or is 
it's it's trying to limit or, or is going to be limited, right? So what that means is is that based off of this, the amount of space you're going to need is going to be less, right? It's going to it's geared towards preserving space, okay? Because you're generating fewer nodes because you know you're not doing this brute force type of search where you're generating all the child nodes, you know, like breadth first search does, for example, right? You're pruning parts of the search tree. Okay, and uh, recursive best first search, um, you know, it's just a version of a star search that is trying to uh, minimize memory by using the call stack. Okay, and then at the very end, when I was flying through talking about different versions of the heuristic functions, you know, those algorithms that depend on the heuristic function, their performance is going to depend on how you craft the heuristic function. And so, we talked about how you know we had the the basic heuristic function version, right? Where um, you know one way was counting the number of tiles that aren't in the right position. Another way was counting all the tiles um, distances from their correct position. Okay, and so you know the first uh, the the first version H one um, had a different performance than the second one, H2, just based off of that definition alone. But then we said, you know, you can derive versions of H1, H2, or any heuristic function, right, by relaxing some of the rules and how you count the scores, okay? And, um, you know, depending on how you relax them can further improve the performance. And then we also talked about pattern databases where, you know, you can take certain patterns within that, um, puzzle, right? You know, you've got the one here, the two here, the three here, and the four here. And based off of prior analysis, you can say, oh, well, any path that leads through here, that leads through a state that has the tiles in these positions, right? Um, all of the options flowing from here have an average cost of, say, blah, right? And so, or blah, very descriptive, right? Of, say, five. And so then you can just put that into a table. And so as you're expanding nodes and as you're generating those states, you can say, oh, well, anything that is derived from this, any state that comes off of this guy, we're gonna have an average cost of five. Well, if there's some other pattern where the average cost is three, let's go over here instead, you know, if three is cheaper. Okay, yeah, so there you go. So that's uh, chapter three. And it's all about, hey, look, agents, um, you know, trying to figure out what to do boils down to a search problem. Okay, you have to understand the difference between that state space and then the search tree that gets generated on top of it and um, you know what the solution is, a series of actions. Um, so you've got your, um, you know, you've got your two-phase operation or two operations that the agent does. The thinking part where it's doing the search based off of your problem definition and then once it's finished its thinking, it says, okay, now it's time to take the action. So it's the AI's turn to play, you know, maybe it's a two-player game, and it's the AI's turn to do something. And then, um, so it thinks, without impacting the actual environment, plays everything out based on the rules of the game, and its head figures out, all right, well, here's a solution that gets me from this state to winning the game. And then there's all those series of actions. That's the solution. And so now, when it's done thinking and it has that solution of all those series of actions, now it executes those actions, comes back to the execution phase, um, and uh, executes all those actions in the actual game itself. Okay? So, in its mind, it would be thinking about the checkerboard when it's its turn. But now, once it's come up with the solution, the order in which to move all the checker pieces, all the checkers, now it comes back to the actual game board and moves all the checkers around. So it's a two-phase operation. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so that's your chapter three. Um, I want to do one more thing here. Um, I want to uh, show you a little bit of code. Okay, so hold on for one sec and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do this. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video and be right back. Okay, so back. Um, so what I wanted to do is give you an example here of uh, you know how you could translate this um, pseudocode of theirs into C++. Okay, and uh, remember, started off this whole series of videos at the very beginning, showing you go how to go check out their source code repository, 
right? Which gives you examples of all this stuff in multiple languages. Um, but, you know, so you, you definitely really want to go take a look at that. Um, but I wanted to also give you an example. So I'm not just saying, hey, go look at that and, you know, without, you know, typing some code up uh, myself, right? So that way you don't feel like I'm just saying, hey, go look at that, you know? So this right here, remember this function, when we were talking about this, this was a function that was responsible for generating a new node, right? And um, multiple search algorithms that we were looking at were calling this function, okay? So this would be one piece of the overall pie that, you know, for the program that you'd be writing, for the software you'd be writing. And so what was this thing supposed to do? It was supposed to create a child node, you know, and keep track of its parent and um, that node that's getting created uh, also has to keep track of the action that spawned it um, as well as any kind of cost right to, to that that uh, you know what the what the total path cost would be that uh, led up to this child right so from the start node or from the initial state which is stored in the start node up through this particular child node containing a particular state right what's the total cost to get from a to b you'd store that in the child node also okay so previous video i'll give you a little bit of a code but just to remind you here um you know maybe the node looks like this okay and uh, a node is going to have to do what it's going to have to um you know, store some representation of the state, however you want to do that. Okay, so let's say I just make it an integer, fine. Um, and then, uh, you know, it has to store some kind of action, right? So maybe that's a character. I'm just making this up. It would be whatever I need it to be, right? I mean, it's it's whatever um, my, my uh, solution calls for, right? Whatever the requirements call for character action um what else there's a cost in here too so maybe that's a, a float right um, cost okay and um let's see what else in here oh who the parent is of course node star parent okay um so yeah and uh, let me move this. Let me see if I can move this over into the whiteboard so that way. You know what? I'll do. I'll just start a second comment here so that way it'll all fit on one screen. Okay. So this is what our node looks like. Okay. And uh, so you'd have a function or a method that has access to that node because otherwise this definition wouldn't work. And then remember in the previous um, sample code that I wrote, I was like, hey, here's what the problem definition looks like, right? So when, when you see something like this in sample code where it says we're passing you the problem, it just it, essentially you can think of it this way. You can think of it literally as that's the problem class, or you can think of it as everything that the child node needs is in scope through this problem, right? So when you read this problem.result, that means that the result function is defined as part of some container called problem, okay? So this child function can call it. Now I'll, I won't type out problem.result every single time because maybe I just wrote everything as standalone functions in my solution, okay? Um, but anyway, so gotta create a new node with these things. So first thing I would need is I would need some state, right? And so what's the state? Well, that would be the result of the parent's state uh, in some action. And so what do we have to pass to this function? You know, the uh, we have to have access to the parent. So I'll call it P. And uh, we have to pass to it the action, which is defined as a character. Um, that's generating this child node, okay? So then the state that uh, is gonna be stored in this child node would be derived from the parent state and the action. So remember the result function is pass the state that's in the parent, okay? And uh, also the action that's generating the new state that's gonna be stored in the child node, right? So then that state goes into uh, this local variable state here. So I guess I'd have to 
make a data type though, wouldn't I? Okay. Um, and then what? Who's your parent? Well, the parent is the parent, right? There's that, that the memory address for that parent node is right here. So I don't need to create a whole separate um, variable for that. I'm just reusing the parameter. But that's what this is talking about. You know, the parent is the parent. Um, the action is the action. Well, I already have that here, so I don't need to define another variable for it. And then the path cost, you know, what did I call that? Float C equals the parent path cost. So I'd have to ask the parent for its cost plus the step cost, okay? And so the step cost would be um, the cost of going from the parent state to this current state, right? So that's one edge within the path, or one, um, you know, the distance between the parent node and the child node in the path. So you've got the entire cost to get to the parent, plus the cost of getting from the parent to the child, okay? So um, step cost needs to have a state, so the parent state, plus the action, okay? Now, now that we have all of those things, okay, we can, create a new node, you know, maybe call it star. Okay, and then uh, we can initialize that, or we can assign to that child node um, its state, right? And, uh, oh crap, I made two, uh, two variables with the same name, didn't I? Right, and we could say, um, the uh, child node's parent, memory address of its parent is P. Um, and then what else? The action that's caused it to get generated. Uh, action equals A. Is that everything? So state action, uh, we gotta store its cost too. Almost forgot that. Child, the path cost, the cumulative path cost to get to this child node from the from the uh, root node, from the start state node, okay? Cost uh, equals uh, C, okay? And then what? Return the child. Okay, so that, that there, there's an example, right? I'm not saying this is the exact example. I'm not saying that this is the exact translation of this because it depends on what the language is. It depends on how you set up everything else. But I'm doing this to give you an idea Right? You need some function that is responsible, and that's the big idea. You need some function that's responsible for generating that child node. You need some function that's responsible for figuring out that step cost. You need some function that defines your transition model. You need some function um, you know, that uh, figures out the possible actions. Okay, And it's through all of those functions that um, you know, the generation of the state space is made. And, uh, you know, the textbook organizes all of these responsibilities around these ideas or around these, the, the, these different functions, right? So the functions are just representing particular tasks that the AI logic has to perform, right? This is like encapsulating, each one of these functions is encapsulating one piece of the overall logic. Okay, and it's just a useful tool for organizing everything, uh, to modularize everything. So, you know, this could look different, right? I mean, it could come in different forms, but it's easy to see, well, what's this thing doing? What, what's the piece of the puzzle here that this function is re responsible for? Creating the child nodes, right? What's the, this function responsible for? What piece of the puzzle is it responsible for? You know, implementing the transition model going from one state, you know, taking some state plus an action and telling you what the next state is, okay? So hopefully that helps. Um, you know, for your programming assignment, you know, you're gonna, um, you're gonna put all this together, okay? There's gonna be a problem, missionary cannibals problem, and you're gonna have to um, use one of the searching algorithms and incorporate all these different pieces to find a solution and then use that solution to um, produce a response on the screen that uh, lays out the correct order in which to move all the missionaries and cannibals from one side to another. But you'll see that when you read the, uh, the homework assignment. So big idea here, 
understand what the different pieces are, understand what's happening, you're doing a search, and understand the efficiency and the cost trade-offs, right? The benefits and the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the cons, the pros and the cons, the different uh, algorithms, okay? Uh, all right, so as usual, you know, if you have any questions about anything, if I lost you anywhere, um, you know, give me a holler, stop by my office hours, click on that off online office hours link, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll, I'm, I'm available twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday, I'll be happy to clarify anything for you. You know, feel free to reach out with me an email first, right? If you if you want to save a, a, a trip, and by trip I mean a login, you know, if, if you don't want to have to show up at a particular time, um, when, it's, when it's convenient for you, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll do my best to give you a response through email within 24 hours. Okay, anyway, so this is going to wrap up Chapter 3. Um, in Chapter 4, we are going to um, look at some other stuff. Uh, in one of my favorite things we're going to look at uh, related to AI is genetic algorithms. And that is going to... Um, that is going to be really 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 cool because you're combining um the idea of the uh theory of evolution with a computer program so you leverage the that theory to find solutions using randomness right so basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at stochastic searching which is searches that are built upon a degree of randomness and that randomness hopefully helps you find a better um, solution, right? So yeah, so we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at some hill climbing algorithms um, and combinations of the two. So it'll be fun. Um, and then after that, chapter five, we'll be looking at how we can uh, modify or adapt these search algorithms that we were just looking at um, into adversarial searches so they actually fit into you know, uh, game scenarios, you know, where I go, you go type games. Anyway, I'll shut up. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see you guys next time.